this is just to prompt you and hopefully you will think of Turkey and these are just some ideas that most people connect with Turkey. They think of beautiful buildings, beautiful beaches, lots of engineering and wonderful food. Okay, so the next one, please. Yesterday, Turkey um, launched an, the next part of its space program and it's going to cost a million dollars, which perhaps explains why we couldn't get any dollars in Turkey on Monday. They didn't have any dollars. They were spending it on their space program. And the next one, please. Right. Now, this is the contrast between Britain, where I'm based, and what's going on in Turkey. In Britain, food is a big thing because, as you probably know, a lot of people have died and a lot of people are very poor. And therefore, we have food banks and feedbacks, a charity I only discovered this morning. What interested me on the Charity Commission website was that 3,490 entries were under food. In Turkey, it is illegal to set up a food bank. Okay. The next one, please. So this is how a Turkish friend described our project. Wow, that will be so beneficial. I believe, especially in the hard days of the pandemic. People are having great difficulty in filling their stomach or finding enough food. Even the Turkish, let alone the refugees or the needy ones. Now, because he's a supporter of our project, unfortunately, he's not allowed to give his name because like the Syrians, he's on a list. Okay, the next one, please. This came from a, a Syrian advisor who is a businessman and extremely capable. And he's given us some tips for setting up a shop. And he quite rightly says they require a delivery mechanism. OK, the next one, please. Now, this is a retrospective. This is how we started in 2013. We started um, after a very muted cry for help from a village in Syria. The village had 200 adults looking after 8,000 internally displaced people from all over Syria. It was minus 22 at one point. They had one bucket that they were using for water. Again, these pictures are quite old, but you'll get a picture of the camp. It doesn't look like a very organized camp, but in fact, I think 11 people died that winter. That was incredible. It was inter-ethnic, interfaith, and um, Incredible, just incredible. We sent what we could and it gave them encouragement. Okay, the next one, please. Now we have to fast forward to Turkey because um, we think ISIS took the village, but it's not very clear. They asked us not to send money to Syria. So we transferred to Turkey and we did two years of scoping and working with another project. And then we decided to go for this one, which was Abu Shams in the background, who is the physiotherapist, um, Suleiman, who is the driver and a very important part of the team, and then one of the children that was being treated. Now, things aren't necessarily what they appear to be. This house and Abu Shams use the ground floor looks really quite grand, but wait till you see inside it. Okay. Oh, we've lost a picture. Um, sorry, this is a previous version. <laughs> so, no, it's missing. It's fine. Um, September 20, um, one year later, we'd established the physio project. 
um, Abu Shams had got promises and, of course, refurbished them. And we've got a, quite a lot of patients and the team were being pretty stretched. Um, they were registered with the Turkish authorities eventually as a sports club. And why not? Why not be a sports club? Um, and the answer to that is that they didn't allow us to be a, a Turkish association. They put the frighteners on us in a very nasty way. So we gave that one up. OK, the next one, please. Well, as we know from today, a lot of it happens in real time. Um, I had a complaint, an inquiry, I don't know what, yesterday, while everyone else was enjoying the talks. We don't have much time for retrospection. And frankly, I don't have a very good memory. But I do try and remember the children and the patients. We have to work under the radar and always remembering that they could close us at any moment for any pretext whatsoever. The management group didn't really work as far as I understand it. And I think people are very reluctant in Turkey to be part of a management group. And having had it out with the Turkish authorities, I can see why. But we have these external advisors Syrian and Turkish, who are incredibly important and give us all kinds of insights. Even so, despite having two physiotherapy centres, Abu Shams house is still where the people drink tea and congregate and occasionally get some therapy. OK, the next one, please. This is not to prove how clever we are. We're not clever at all, we're incredibly stupid. Um, when we first launched the website for a village in Syria, I was studying terrorism and um, security. I never understood security, I understood terrorism. And we launched at the University of Kent, bless them. We launched in the politics department of Kent, but we were not allowed to use their studio because we were not staff. So we would have had to drive to the BBC in another town, um, which I didn't really take to very much. Um, so we missed that interview. And it, ever since then, the press and the TV have stayed well clear of us, I think. Occasionally, The Guardian picks us up, but only to ask us questions not to print anything. So in contrast, Abu Shams printed some flyers or leaflets. Um, we use what they write, which is very creative and highly instructive in our various newsletters, which go out of every, when we get around to it basically, about every six weeks, sometimes more often. We've got a current story about Iraq slaves in Iran, which is pretty nasty, but we do print nasty stories in our newsletters because they're not in any of the other media. We also include stories of what happens to the refugees in transit between Syria and Turkey, which is again pretty nasty. Right, we try to network with other NGOs and some of that works pretty well. And some of it is just water off a duck's back, but it needs to be done. And it's delightful when people congratulate us on what we're doing. And when it comes from Syrians, it's even more important. Right, the car archives really, it's my laptop and thousands of photographs. And the Charity Commission, of course, have to have an annual report and accounts. Um, which will be done in due course. This is all going live to a journalist who is um, constructing the next YouTube video for us, which we find quite a useful channel. Okay, the next one, please. Right, our main objectives, um, the project 
in Turkey started because I was apprehended on a minibus, um, a dolmosh, for speaking Arabic. Well, first of all, I can't speak Arabic. And secondly, the man took great exception because I was trying to. And he said, you mustn't speak Arabic on a bus. And I said, why not? Well, he was a businessman in Dubai, I think, and just home for the holidays. But he pointed out that there was a lot of conflict between the two communities and it was better to keep a low profile. I think we've heard this story before somewhere. So I talked to my chums in the UN and believe it or not, I do have chums in the UN. And they said, well, the chat was absolutely right. There's a huge conflict between the communities. So I thought, right, maybe that's our possibility then. So unlike the UN, because I like to have a dig at the UN, um, we don't have enough money to recruit staff. And our staff aren't even paid pocket money sometimes, let alone a salary. This is in common with many of the Syrian NGOs. They're simply furloughed they're told to go and find other work or just sit at home for three months or so. And then they're paid when the money comes through again. But they're paid retrospectively, so they get back pay. That doesn't apply to us because we don't have any back pay. Consequently, people are working far too much um, and the hours are horrendous and it's actually no good. It's, it's, I talked to Abishams about it, but he does like to work. So what we're trying to do is create profit centers. And again, Abishams doesn't agree with me on this. My rationale for a, a profit center is that otherwise they're not gonna get their salary. So that the cafe and the shop have to make a profit so they can be reinvested. Um, he and other people think we're just doing it out of charity. It's absolutely not true. Now, the Turkmen came and went. Um, we hope they come back again. But as you probably know, Turkey uses mercenaries in other conflicts, including the Turkmen, who have a warlike kind of profile. They take them to other places in their army planes and they fight battles and some of them return and some of them die. And the ones that return are in a bad state. And that's why they approach for us for physiotherapy. In other words, to bind them up. Then the um, COVID struck and the whole thing got put on the back burner. By then we'd got a new physiotherapy center for them but there were no clients, no patients, and no money. So that's why we're redeveloping one of the centers. What we'd like to do is include languages, which are absolutely foremost. Some of the refugees in the area are not Syrian. They come from Morocco, from Sudan, from Eritrea, goodness knows where, all kinds of languages and all kinds of countries. And very often they arrive with almost no skills and certainly no skills in the Turkish market. So if we can provide them with some skill training, that would be great. In contrast, it has to be said that the girls and women are a bit overweight, I hear, because they're not out and about. So they're not taking exercise. And it would be nice to give them some exercise classes, but. Um, you need a slightly bigger room. And at the moment, with the weather, it hasn't been very proficient. So what we're trying to do is gain further trust in the communities. OK. We need to revisit the Turkish government because they visit us. So we have to visit them. and. It's quite routine for foreigners to be interrogated by the Turkish police. It's not a nice experience, but it has to be done. Eventually they laugh, but it takes a long time to get a joke out of them. I've been put in the street on one occasion because I was foreign with the wrong color hair and so on. And so I know what it's like to be on the receiving end. 
and some of the um, feelings that Turkish people can have. The local government put the frighteners on us twice, once in the town hall, and that was the most chilling of all. And secondly, um, in a community, out in the community, and they put the frighteners on the mukhtar who we were trying to deal with. And that was horrible. And basically, we packed our bags and left that community because we could have done so much more damage. It was unbearable. So um, the physio centers are officially recognized as sports centers, which is terrific. And that's all Abisham's work. And then another bit of his work is trying to negotiate a bank account. Well, we don't have 3,000 Turkish liras, and he's arranged um, a cut price of 1,000. Um, I won't go into more because I don't know it. The irony of this is that Kisle, who are the Turkish Red Crescent, no less, invited me to join their team because they said, you like helping people. Why don't you come and work with us? Well, I can think of several reasons, but um, the next slide, please. the food project. And this is the great highway between Rihanli, which is one of the great entrances into Turkey. It's currently the only one that's officially open. It's the cross-border gate between Syria, otherwise known as Idlib, and Rihanli, which is technically in Turkey, although Syria would like to take the whole province. Antakya is only 40 kilometers away, but my goodness, it's quite scary. Um, I travel with a trusted driver who's worked with war correspondents and knows the police and knows the school. But if you're a Syrian refugee, you don't have privileges like traveling from one town to the other or one province to the other. You can be apprehended at any moment. And if you don't have the right documents, otherwise known as kimliks, you are not allowed to go any further. You are rejected. A lot of people don't bother to take the risk. They simply don't try and travel. Um, elsewhere, we tried to explain that um, we see, this is Abu Sham's thinking, the first initial wave of refugees out of Syria were by and large educated people with some money in their pockets and therefore they were welcomed in Turkey because they had commercial viability. They set up businesses, um, and they probably became lecturers in colleges and all kinds of things and they were a great asset to Turkey and they would have paid their taxes were they able to. Now the second wave which is again huge and much huger are people who sadly are lacking in education, have all kinds of um, unfortunate cultural um, traditions, let's say. I'm trying to be kind of not judgmental here, but some of the things that you've heard from jihad are unfortunately quite common in the Syrian community. So we've got not just selling off young children, as bribes, but um, all sorts of violence. And um, cousin marriage, which is something that Abu Shams would talk about, it leads to all kinds of physical and mental disabilities, which he tries to cope with as a physiotherapist, but very tiring. And really, you know, what's the outcome? Right, the next one, please. You will have seen the picture of the bridges, which I didn't explain in the last picture. This is where people go to congregate to find work. And you'll see great crowds of them every day. Thank you. Thank you for that. So this, the picture with the truck on one side, that's a small group. Clearly, um, you can't take these pictures up close. But there they are, and absolutely masses of them, even in the winter. And generally speaking, they're very underfed as well as underskilled. Okay, 
move forward. Now this is Abu Sham's project. Nobody else can take any credit whatsoever for this project. And please try not to be revolted by what you read. So Abu Sams is not, in fact, Syrian. He's Iraqi, but he holds dual nationality. So he understands the cultures of both countries. And alongside the takeaway, we plan a mini market, which provides all food items. OK, so the money um, was sent to Turkey on Monday last. That will be one week tomorrow. So this has all happened within one, within one week, which is why we talk about real time. This, the premises used to be the physiotherapy center for the women and children. It's currently being transformed into the mini market and the takeaway cafe. OK. This family are an absolute heartbreak. Um, one of my jobs is to take photographs, and I'm responsible for this photograph. They wouldn't let me take their house, which was barely a house. It was more of a hovel. And if it had been my house, I wouldn't have wanted the picture taken either. Now, why we visited them was because one of the children needed some physiotherapy, the one with his knees up on the sofa. I noticed, because I'm a trained social worker, apart from anything else, that um, the woman appeared to be very frightened and had bruises. And afterwards, Abu Shams said that um, she was, in fact, the victim of domestic abuse, which he'd clocked a long time ago. So there they are, little children and um, very poor. And the complaint that we had yesterday was about this family. And it came from Damascus, for goodness sake. How can we get complaints in Britain from Damascus? Well, we can, because there's a network. There's a network of Syrians. And clearly, they've got a lot on their minds. And they just take a pot shot at anybody they can think of. In this case, the father has been quite aggressive. and apprehended Abisham in the street and said, why haven't you given me money? Now, it's just as well I'm not in Turkey, because with the colour of my hair, everybody would ask me for money, not realising how poor I really am. OK, the next one. This goes on to talk about remote working. Now, it sounds fabulous if you belong to Amazon or any of those other high-tech companies. It's not always quite such fun in our case because the mobiles didn't work this morning, the Wi-Fi didn't work this morning. We use different keyboards, an Arabic keyboard and a non-Arabic keyboard, don't always agree. Um, I put have to put huge emphasis on money and accounts um, for the charity commission. Um, and yet, you know, this is not Abu Shams's top priority at all. So people often say to me, why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? Or why don't you do the next thing? And I please encourage you to ask those questions. And I will try and give a polite answer. OK, the next one. The advantages of working remotely are that the focus is mostly in Turkey. It, it lands on Abu Shams and his family's shoulders. He refers to me as I must talk to my partner, which is rather sweet. He does, in fact, have a real um, business partner. His English has improved leaps and bounds because I don't speak Arabic. And I try not to bother him with my research, except for jokes. 
um, we joke about my extinction project, for example. And the other thing is that nobody can harass me very easily. Not the police, not the client, nobody. And I do have the benefit of some local contacts because I made about 12 trips to Turkey. So one or two people have come up trumps. Now, these are the sort of people that, let's say that should help. Can we say that? Um, I will say that. Um, I came across them by mistake. Nobody else had heard of them. They live in a very smart compound. Well, old, sorry, traditional Turkish building in Hatay. I think there were about seven paid workers, of which about three were lawyers and four were admin. And how many actual clients did they have? I think I saw three and I was there for several hours. It was incredibly distressing. They had more computers. I mean, we've got two laptops, one in Turkey and one here. And they had about seven full PCs. Um, they had AC, they had TV, they, you know, they had it. They had everything except clients. And I said to them, you know, what is it you actually do, you guys? I'm slightly different. I'm, kind of, I'm more diplomatic with Turkish people, but they told me that their remit was to look at the problems that tenants were having with landlords, and they were only allowed to help Syrians. I, I'm not going to go any further. I'm really not. My feeling is this is only a gut feeling, and it's going to be recorded, I hope that there's a quid pro quo between the Turkish government and the UN, that the Turkish government allow them to set up this center on condition that they fulfill certain requirements. That's my feeling. It's a dirty business, humanitarian aid. Right, so um, we did try um, the EU lift program, but clearly we didn't have the expertise and we didn't have the track record. They give mega bucks to Turkey. DARP, who are Cairo based, um, refused us a platform, having messed us around for four days. And that annoyed me hugely. But they deal with bigger, big projects in the Middle East. So what have we got? We've got Abu Shams, who's trained as a physiotherapist, and his local businessman, who we hope is not involved in slavery, and we've been trying to find out. The, the value systems in the West are so completely different to those in Turkey, it goes without saying. I'm sorry I have to even raise it, but I feel I have to. This is a man who deals in people. He um, provides, he recruits, and he provides people to go out into the fields and work as agricultural laborers. Now you might say that's brilliant, that's jobs. But then you say, uh huh, who gets paid? I rest my case. The next one, please. So this is where we are, all clean and tidy. And this is what we tell people on our newsletter, that um, the premises are a lovely building and that we've got fantastic people working there. And the patients or clients or whatever you call them are very um, appreciative. And we have males and females of all ages. OK, the next one, please. Now, this is the kind of challenge that I'm going to throw down. We don't do ice bucket challenges. We do this challenge. On Monday last, I had 694 euros in my pocket, otherwise known as my bank account. OK, so what do I do with that? That's my money for a month. I'm on the lowest grade of pension in the UK, which is the state pension. And I'm very thankful for it. Other people might say, oh, right, that's the summer holiday. Yeah, we can put that together with something else and we could or we could get the roof repaired or whatever. And I thought, what the hell? Why should I have this money? So um, 
I took it along to the post office and it went to Abisham. And that's how the shop and the food pocket will be financed. We actually put our money where our mouth is. Meanwhile, we are approaching the Sikhs and everybody else we can think of to give us money. The Sikhs, as you may or may not know, are experts in food. They provided food for the truckers who were stuck on the way to Dover, and they provide food for down and outs in London. They seem to be absolutely brilliant. So we don't take any salaries because we don't have any money. I try to keep £20 in the bank. I think that's prudent. But £20 is all we have. So don't try suing us. We <laughs> the word artwork is hilarious because most people would burst out laughing when they saw our artwork. But some people are kind enough to congratulate us. And the work we do with the press is, well, we work with a very glossy magazine, which is a joke, from one of the best healed areas in Britain. They asked us to write for them, but nothing else is paid. In fact, that magazine doesn't pay us. It just prints it occasionally. So we have to see the funny, the amusing, the joking side of life, because otherwise we'd be despairing. So Abhya Shams and I communicate all the time with jokes and videos and anything else that takes our mind off reality. That's the end.